Uh, Jack Godfrey is our co-host this morning, so he'll be the one that's leading the responses in the call to worship. And Gail is our reader, so she will be the one who will, um, you'll be hearing her voice and seeing her face pop up as well during our, uh, our service. So good morning and welcome to worship. I'm Reverend Catherine McDonald. I am the intentional interim minister at Stairs Memorial United Church in uh, the north end of Dartmouth. And welcome to worship this morning. We gather in the name of Jesus Christ, who is for us the light of the world. And as we gather, we are reminded that we live and work and worship on lands that are the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. May we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. A few announcements to make. Uh, one was uh, yesterday we held our first, uh, what do we call it? Community free market exchange out in the parking lot where people could bring stuff and take stuff and there was no money exchanged. And uh, a big thank you to um, Vivian Morgan and Rhonda Burke for coordinating that and for other folks who did some organizing behind the scenes. It was uh, great fun and lots of people showed up and I, I had lots of conversations from folks in the community who were just delighted that um, we were doing this. And do not underestimate the uh, the value of a good name and recognition in the community. You know, we did this outside because of COVID, but, you know, having it outside gave us way more visibility than it would, would have done if we'd held it in the hall downstairs. So it was great. I'm glad we did it. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channel as we look towards um, in-person worship and live streaming that worship. Uh, the easiest way to live stream worship for the most people is through YouTube, but in order to live stream to mobile devices like tablets, iPads, phones, we need 100 subscribers on our YouTube channel. We have 12. So all of you who are sitting around whatever tables or chairs you are sitting around, subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's just Stairs Memorial United Church on, on YouTube. It's the easiest thing to do. With those being some of the announcements of our faith community, I'm going to light the Christ candle. Because whenever we gather, we light the candle. And we light it as a symbol of the light that came into the world in creation. We light it as a symbol of the light that was more fully revealed in Jesus Christ. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness will never overcome it. Let us sing together. Come and find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the grave where we are laid. Let us And I invite you to join in the responses. Families come in all kinds of configurations. God has created us to be in relationship with one another in a variety of ways. We dream of families living together in harmony. Our dream has not yet been realized. 
God's dream of families living together in harmony. God's dream has not yet been realized. May each of us remember that we are a beloved child of God. Come, let us worship God. And let us pray together. O oh God, you are our mother and our father. Our human families may disappoint us, betray us, deny us. But you, O oh God, never will. When our immediate worries overwhelm us, help us to take the long view. Remind us that while each of us is significant, and together we are just, we are a community, we are just one tiny part of the whole of human history. We turn to you, knowing that you understand us, forgive us, and love us like a mother. And so we pray with confidence and faith. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we're going to sing together, I am a child of God. I'm hearing from folks that you can't hear. Can t somebody uh, let me know? Is that true? Yeah, there was no sound. There's no sound? We can hear you, but not, uh, not the singing. Interesting. Okay, let me try that again.
child of God. I am a glimpse of God's new creation. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I am an endless prayer. I am a yearning for contemplation. I am an endless prayer. I am an endless prayer. I am an angry voice. I am compassion and consternation. I am an angry voice. I am an angry voice. I am a cry. Thanks for that uh, message that you weren't getting any sound. And I invite you to get comfortable. I got a little wordy this week. Sit back, relax. And I invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. May these words, offered with humility and hope, draw us closer to you, O God, and one another. Amen. Everything happens for a reason and other lies I've loved is the title of a book and a podcast by Kate Bowler, a young professor at Duke Divinity School. She wrote it after being diagnosed at age 35 with stage four colon cancer. Everything happens for a reason. Have you said those words, perhaps meaning to comfort someone? Perhaps even meaning to comfort yourself? I don't believe they're true. In fact, I believe that they are damaging. Imagine hearing those words after your young husband inexplicably dies in a Tim Hortons drive through as happened to a young woman in my former pastoral charge. Imagine hearing those words, living with violence in your home. Imagine hearing those words, being a recipient of food at the food bank. Everything doesn't happen for a reason. But I am convinced that God can take everything and redeem it. God doesn't cause some horrible events to happen just so that we could learn some lessons, but God takes our pain and our suffering and can use it and us to turn towards healing and wholeness. So that's where I'm going to get to in the end, God's continual arc towards justice, towards redemption and grace. But I'm going to take a path through our biblical text, take a look at family values, tie in Orange Shirt Day, and touch on the ongoing tension over Micmac fishers attempting to exercise their right to fish. First, let's take a look at the biblical story. This week, we jumped 20 chapters in the First Testament narrative. Last week, we left with Abram's vision of God taking him outside his tent and telling him that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the night sky. Before we get to this week's reading, I want to highlight what's taken place between the two sections. Abram has a son, Ishmael, by his wife's slave, Hagar, and Ishmael is considered to be Abram's heir. Sarah has Isaac in her old age. Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. 
Lot sleeps with his daughters in order to continue his lineage. While in a foreign land, Abraham passes Sarah off as his sister to the king to give, and gives him to her as a wife in exchange for safe passage. Hagar and Ishmael are sent away now, now that there's a son by Sarah. Abraham is commanded to sacrifice Isaac. Sarah dies. Isaac and Rebecca are married. Abraham remarries. Who knew? I didn't know that. He has six more children. Esau and Jacob are born to Isaac and Rebekah. Jacob is tricked into marrying Lee, even though he wants to marry Rebekah, but then marries Rachel as well. Jacob wrestles with an angel and his name becomes Israel. How's that for some family values? We enter today's story in Jacob slash Israel's old age with sibling rivalry between his sons that goes terribly wrong. Let's listen to these words as if hearing them for the first time, as written in selected verses in chapters 37 through 50. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There, there we were binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of the dreams and his words. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and they took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes. He returned to his brother and said, the boy is gone and I, where can I turn? Then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. They had the long robe with sleeves taken to their father and they said, this we have found. See now whether it is your son's robe or not. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph went when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept. 
down before him and said, we are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a, number, a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. First of all, how many of us grew up with Joseph's coat of many colors? I sure did. In fact, I can hear Dolly Parton singing it right now. Apparently, there are translation issues, but regardless of whether it was a coat of many colors or whether it was a long-sleeved coat, it would have set Joseph apart from physical labor. And it was labor that his brothers had to undertake. And so they were jealous. They stripped it from him. Joseph's brothers stripped him of his identity as a favored son. They sold him into slavery. He gains the king's favor, loses the king's favor, gets accused of sleeping with the king's wife, gets thrown into jail, interprets dreams for various people, gets out of jail, becomes governor, and is in charge of all the food stores. And then his brothers come in, come in supplication, for they and all their kin are suffering from a great famine. And rather than returning violence with violence, Joseph treats them as family, even to say, even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. Well, you know, Joseph and I disagree there. I probably would have said something, even though you did harm to me and bad things happened, there is no reason for me to retaliate now. God would not want me to harm you and your children. This story has parallels with that of those people, those children who were forced into the residential school system. The authorities in one of them stripped Phyllis Jack Wested of her identity as an individual. The story of Orange Shirt Day has some similarities. Although in this case, the stripping away was not because the child was favored. Why orange for Orange Shirt Day? Because of Phyllis Jack Wested from the Stuetlam Heitlam First Nation who went to St. Joseph Mission Residential School on her first day of school, she wore an orange shirt that her grandmother had given her. It was immediately taken away and it marked the beginning of her long separation from family and community. A separation caused by the actions of the church and the federal government. <clears throat> what these two things, what the Joseph story and Phyllis's story have in common is the abuse of power. Joseph's brother's jealousy of his place in his father's affection drove them to use their physical strength to overpower him and lies to excuse their behavior. In the residential school system, the government and the churches used physical strength, religion, and the power of authority to impose a way of life on First Nations people. I know that some of you are really uncomfortable with that statement because what we were taught was something very different. But we can continue to learn even when we have to tear down some of our cherished beliefs. One of those, one of those beliefs is that Indigenous people don't have the right to earn a moderate living from hunting and fishing. You know, Joseph wound up in a foreign land and prospered. 
And we, at least those of us of white ancestry, most of us, came, our ancestors came here as settlers. I know mine did on both sides and prospered. And we prospered often thanks to indigenous people who inhabited the land and who continue to inhabit the land. Each week, I acknowledge that we live and work and worship on land that is on unceded ter territory, because it is that. Treaties of peace and friendship were made by the governor of Nova Scotia with Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy communities in Nova Scotia. These are the same treaties that were upheld and interpreted by the Supreme Court in the Donald Marshall case in 1999. They included the right to harvest fish, wildlife, wild fruit, and berries to support a moderate livelihood for the treaty beneficiaries. We are in the midst of a new sort of uprising these days. The 60s saw civil rights, women's rights, we are in the midst of a new kind of uprising. The residential school's aim was to take the Indian out of the Indian and turn them into white people, albeit with, white, with dark skin. And to a certain degree, that has been a success. First Nations people have become educated. They are professionals, including lawyers who have studied the peace and friendship treaties and who are challenging us, the people of Nova Scotia, to uphold them. Just like the long arc of justice and redemption and grace in Joseph's story, there is the long arc of justice and redemption and grace in the current story. All the stories should make you uncomfortable. Joseph's story, Phyllis's story, and the ongoing story of the Indigenous right to a moderate living through hunting and fishing, or rather the, the protests against the Indigenous right to a moderate living. They are not stories that we can tie up in a nice, neat little bow and then put them away on a shelf and forget about them. They are stories that get under our skin if we let them. They are stories of God's continuing arc towards justice, towards redemption, and towards grace. And thanks be to God for those stories. Amen.
was master of the house ruler of all to teach he his wisdom to the counselors and the ruler of the nation set him free bless the holy one our god your justice reaches every corner of the earth bless the holy We come to our offering time, and I know you folks to be generous people, generous with your time and generous with all that you have and all that you are. And so I invite you to imagine what you are placing in this offering plate this week, what you are offering to God through the gifts that you have that are innate in your person whether they be gifts of time or talent or treasure, I invite you to place them in there now. The world, God's wondrous deeds. have trouble moving on from Byron's Ministry of Music and I'm not sure why. Let's try this one more time. There we go. We have this ministry and we are not discouraged. It is by God's own power that we may live and 
Gracious God, we thank you for all your people. We thank you for those who work for grace and for peace and for justice. We thank you for the varied gifts that are made possible with your gifts among your people. We thank you for all the ways in which faith and love and community are made known. We ask that you bless these gifts and those given in a variety of ways and places. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us come together as a community of faith in prayer. O oh God, our God, the seasons turn. We in the Northern Hemisphere are turning towards winter, where the coolness overtakes us and snow will blanket the earth. And yet on, in the Southern Hemisphere, the spring is taking root new shoots are making themselves known, breaking forth from the earth. It's a reminder, O oh God, that our perspective, our, our part of the world is not all of the world. And a reminder that we, we only know what we see here. And yet you created the whole world and love and honor and cherish all its people and all of its places. So help us to place ourselves, at least metaphorically, in other places. Help us to open our eyes to other viewpoints and other ways of seeing things. Help us to love others as you love them. Help us to see that long arc of justice towards redemption and grace and justice. And even as those are big dreams and hopes we carry within ourselves the small, tiny, and perhaps not tiny hopes and hurts of our own hearts. You know, loved ones that are ill or mourning, pain and sorrow that only we know and are not, not privy to share. broken relationships, the pain of seeing people going hungry and knowing that our food bank only fills a gap. We pray this morning, especially for Stephen Fram as Reverend Stephen Fram, as he mourns the death of his father this past week. May he be comforted by knowing that we pray for him and hold him and his family in prayer. Even as we pray for all who mourn,
We pray for the joyous sense of community that was present at the community free market exchange yesterday. Engagement and conversation and goodwill and activity in our parking lot that has been empty except for food bank clients for so long. We pray for children and school teachers and aides and janitors and custodians as we are into week three of school. May, may they continue to remain well as this could be the telling week of COVID-19 for regathering for school. In silence or aloud, we lift up the prayers of our hearts. And we pray for ourselves that we may be the people you envision us to be. Amen. And our closing prayer is for the healing of the, or our closing hymn rather, is for the healing of the nations. And the the logo that you're going to see is from the uh, 43rd General Council, uh, Risking Faith and Daring Hope. Oh, Christ. into the world knowing that God loves you. Go out into the world working towards redemption and justice and grace. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you each and every day, this day and always. Amen.
so I have stopped the live stream to Facebook and I will put you into some breakout rooms if you want to have some conversation. Thank you, Jack, for being co-host, and thank you, Gail, for reading. things of that nature and she never used it what these 